The Everything Sequel Podcast is brought to you by Brew Bar and Tua Tea Fitness. Mike and Tom are washing their mouths out with soap because the Everything Sequel Podcast contains explicit language. Hello and welcome to the Everything Sequel Podcast. This is the Blade Edition. We're talking Blade 2 today. Michael Schantz here of the How Dare You Awards. Joining me... That karate vampire himself, Tom Stewart of Lonesome Whistle Productions. Give it to him, Tom. Well, like my daddy said before he killed my mom, you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. <laughs> when I saw when I saw Ron Perlman in this film, I thought to myself, he's had a funny old career. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Because I think, like, when when he first arrived on the scene, Hollywood had him pegged as a sideshow. Like a kind of circus. You know when he first arrived on the scene, right? Beauty and the Beast? No. Come on, you 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 just watched it. I did. (laughs) I wouldn't call that arriving on any scene, ever. Um, (laughs) Nobody knows about that but you, Michael, (laughs) even the existence of that movie. Nobody else is thinking Ice Pirates right now? Just automatically? (laughs) Yeah. But then, like, a couple of European directors built on that idea of him as a circus freak, but crafted him into a leading man. Right. You know, like in in City of Lost Children, he plays a strong man. Right, yes. But he's the lead of the movie... Hell, you know, Del Toro does Hellboy with him. Um, and then, you know, by the early 2000s, he's playing a real human in a, in TV, a TV series. a show, right. <laughs> that is hugely successful. And I just thought it was fascinating here because there's so many layers to his character in the movie. Because that whole sort of vampire blood pack, I think they call it. Yeah. It reminds me so much of the Marines from Aliens. Yeah, it, yeah. But it also reminds me of the pirates from Aliens, Alien Resurrection. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Which he's also in. One of in. whom is Ron Perlman. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, like, like many things in this movie, you know, I, I give Del Toro grief for being more superficial than people thinks, think he is. But referentially, there's a lot of layers here. Absolutely. In this movie. And that's the one thing that kind of impressed me um, as it went on. All right. There's, there's, um, we'll, we'll talk about that. I think, I think there are four distinct layers of this movie. Oh, okay. In terms of reference, in terms of intertextuality. All right. <laughs> well, of course, ladies and gentlemen, we'll get to that. We're talking Blade Two, a 2002. Here has never mentioned that again. <laughs> 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 the audience will go on to hear none of that. <laughs> we'll get it. We'll end up on a tangent talking. <laughs> Talking about bros, <laughs> and I'll never get there. <laughs> anyway, sorry to interrupt. You're fine. <laughs> We're talking Blade Two, a 2002 film, of course, direct- directed by Guillermo del Toro. Uh, you know him, like the first yeah. one. Yeah, <laughs> according to Tom. According, according to somebody who's never seen that and hadn't seen these two movies until a few days ago. Uh, but he's done Kronos and Mimic, Pan's Labyrinth, both Hellboy movies, Pacific Rim, The Shape of Water, and Nightmare Alley. What is Pacific Rim? That's the big robots battle big monsters movie. Oh, that movie completely passed me by. Lucky you. If, you. if you'd have asked me what that movie was, I would have said it's like a... Like a submarine movie. The best thing about that like, movie... Like, Crims- like Crimson Tide. The, be- the best thing about that movie was it gave birth to a new How Dare You category for a couple of years. The uh, movie that sounds like a porno title... Uh, titles combined that sound like a porno title. Pacific Rim Jobs. <laughs> oh, right. Nice. <laughs> but this movie... You do that... You blade to blade to blade trip. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> this movie had uh this is the high water mark for the series by one percent, Tom. This movie has fifty eight percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, okay. So that's interesting. I was really prepared to hear a higher percentage. Though. Were you? Where am I getting this from? Is it just Del Toro? Probably. 
I really. But like I, I mean, said, I, like I the felt... fans of this series are diehard fans of this series. But I really thought I'd be more in the minority. Because I'm apathetic both about Del Toro and martial arts movies in general. Mm-hmm. And I feel like my generation as a whole is, is not. Is not. <laughs> <laughs> so that's interesting. <clears throat> because, oh, that's very interesting because that's not wrong. Yeah. <laughs> like, I would not say that's too high or too I, low. I think, I, I I think, that, that's, I think just that's just right. And this is also the high watermark Goldilocks. Monetarily, a budget of $54 million. Opening weekend, 32.5, 82.3 in the USA, and in the world, $155 million. So, profit. Right. As I say, a, 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 give me a bucket of popcorn yeah. and Reese's Pieces mixed in. Um, I, I would I would gladly contribute that money. <laughs> Unfortunately, Netflix, Netflix got my shit. There you go. <laughs> Certainly for this month. <laughs> excuse me all right one of my first questions for you for this particular series is and of course what we gotta talk a little bit about blade trinity as well what is with this series and double cold opens <laughs> <laughs> what's going on there yeah, they love two cold opens in this series. Well, more, more of a yeah. Well, it's a sequel, so you got to have two cold opens. <laughs> That's isn't that pretty much the first thing we mm-hmm. have discovered about sequels? Yeah. You've got to have at least two cold opens if you're going to be calling yourself a sequel. <laughs> well, it also I know of the cold open impasse, but yeah, these series seem to say, "Hey, it's a sequel. We got to up the ante." Well, speaking of, of of stuff we always talk about, mm-hmm. um, I mean, precedent here might be the Bond films because they they also kind of have two cold opens. It's seven minutes in, I know. <laughs> I haven't <laughs> talked about it for a while, um, but it's really fun. I mean, because I I the, the way it starts in a blood bank, mm-hmm. I was like, it's it's kind of starting with a joke almost, right? It's like yeah, it's like. So this vampire goes into a blood bank. You know, it's that's that's kind <laughs> right, of like yes. that's a st- it's the starting point of a like a not very good SNL yeah. sketch. And in fact, what it really reminded me of was and this is where Del Toro actually makes you kind of reflect on whether it was intentional or not because you think he's exactly the kind of guy who would know this. There was a night gallery segment with Cesar Romero and it was like a 2-3 minute I mean portmanteau segment doesn't cover it it was like a sketch mm-hmm. basically like an snl yeah. sketch and it was dracula goes into a blood bank <laughs> and caesar romero's dracula which is wonderful that's great but that's what it reminded and i wondered whether that was a poll because he's the kind of guy who, would who know. loves that yeah. who loves that era of 60s 70s um gothic uh you know he's a huge hitchcockian and night gallery is definitely in that that's thing. interesting so um, but it, but I immediately it was like it was like this 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 is, this is just a gag to start the movie on almost, <laughs> and I kind of like that. Well, obviously, so um, we have a we have two cold opens. We have uh, you know we're gonna see the blood bank and we're gonna see the vampire, the chin vampire who hates other vampires. Someone going into this movie who had not seen the original Blade, I thought everything was gonna look like it was World War Two. <laughs> right, because everything in that blood looks bank, World War Two. Church, Churchill wall rooms. Look. <clears throat> There's a guy in a Nazi uniform. There's a woman who looks like a land girl with a right. like with a haircut. <laughs> I was just like, oh, okay. So the style of this these these movies is nineteen like mid nineteen forties World War Two chic. Well, because all uh, of these movies have <laughs> this one probably the most really out of all a... three, but they all have kind of a noir bent too. True. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, they have a lot of different bands. True. And the, yes. The, the, and the, the big one that comes here for me is 1980s pop culture. Because <laughs> you've got Luke Goss from Bross uh, with Freddy Fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is a solid layer of 1980s retro <laughs> that we're establishing here. This is one of my four layers of this movie. Okay. There you go. Is, is, is this is layer things. one? 
No, no, this is layer okay. two. Layer one is reference out to everything that's going on at, in cinema at the time. And you've already spoken sure. to this. The Matrix, Spider-Man, uh, you mentioned the Bournes. That, that also, but it's not know, doing vampire, it as well. The vampire craze, um, you know, these kind of borrowed uh, dance music of the time, all these kind of borrowed iconographies. Mm-hmm. That's the top layer. Your second layer is your 1980s retro um your kind of bros freddy fingers <laughs> uh we've got aliens and terminator mixed sprinkled in there right. an actor uh called Danny John Jules who's a british actor who plays Assad in this movie from a, a 1980s british sitcom called Red Dwarf the science fiction famous is that the guy uh, you like the, yeah probably more, like a famous science fiction sitcom um so yeah that's your second layer that's All that's right. uh, and it's and it's right from the beginning with you know it's like who puts who puts bros in a movie <laughs> <laughs> if you're not obsessed with that period in history <laughs> you know that's great but he does i mean we get like we get a sequel and version right up when well I, you know, I don't know for sure, but that bite doesn't look like a regular vampire bite. The way right. it splatters everywhere. No. So first of all, I'm thinking, hmm, are these are these, is this like acid reflux vampires? What's going yeah. on? Um, and then he says, I hate vampires. So it's like, oh, oh we're, change, so we're changing the we're, monster. Yeah, exactly. Or, or are we? <laughs> I mean, we are, but but it wants, but you, by it design. wants you to think they are. Right, yeah. but they're just double, mon- you know, they're double Yeah, vampires, they're just double I'd monsters, say, which, right. We're, um, and then the title sequence, you know, recap montage. Recap montage, montage exactly. Dodge, yeah, that's my second another note. Another Inverse. <laughs> so, uh, but all kind of, kind of dressed up as if it's like the opening of a black exploitation uh-huh. movie or like even a Bond title sequence as well. With a, with a voiceover, which I, I was like... It's like, is this a TV show? <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it feels like, you know, Blade the series yeah. would begin in the same way with Blade saying, "I am Blade. This is what and this I is do. how I, I same thing. this is how I take care of business from it's, day to it's day. The same thing. It's the same thing every week. This is what you're gonna see. A little <laughs> bit of this, a little bit of that. And it's like they, yeah, this could easily be expanded into a series, and you could use the same title yeah. sequence. Um. So I did wonder whether that was like the influence of television, kind of. That's interesting. Hold. Um, but again, I was a little bit sniffy about this until I saw Blade Trinity, and I was like, "Oh, I guess this is." The so did you stay sniffy about it like the whole time after you were done watching it? Did it only become better after watching Trinity? No, I liked a lot of things about it, but there were certain okay. aspects of it that I thought were was somewhat kind of cheesy yeah. and contrived so and let me I ask you about this because I, I was and then i saw how they were done in way trinity and i thought well you know there's worse things <laughs> well that's one of my questions for you because we have you know we have this voiceover recap and then we have essentially this second cold open i do have to say that the next note i have to your point is I hope this swish zoom effect they keep using every few seconds <laughs> calms down as it's already <laughs> irritating me. <laughs> so that's probably the answer to your question. Well, my question for you is because eventually we're going to see him start killing some vampires. Right. And my, my note, you know, we've had this note before where we say, we say something like, the good work they think they're doing with their CGI (laughs) is not quite up to snuff in the way they think. And yet, and which I believe is true of these movies. And yet there's still some style to it that almost makes it work. I have exactly the same note. Like the, the, the it's like, it's, it's plainly CGI. Yeah. Right. Never confuse it for practical, but it's tempered to have a slightly visceral quality Mm -hmm. to it. And I think, and again, I'm reading this through Del Toro because how could you not? I, I think he's, I think also the effects are crafted in a way that reminds me of stop motion. Yeah, a exactly. More. Especially with the And I think that's what and, I you know, end Ray up, Harry that's Housen's why I think famous, I end yeah. up saying, okay, I like it. It's because yeah. of the stop motion aspect. 
I think, oh, I would say overall, the balance of practical to CGI for this era of cinema is pretty solid. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there are moments when they make a specific choice to go practical and it really makes a difference. Yeah. I'll tell you the things the that movie. I think that not to mention the fact that, you know, the, all the combat. Right pretty much is practical and that's huge but there is some cgi work in the combat yeah but you can see where that the is jumping and around it, stuff it stands out oh yeah but that's that doesn't look good now it's not gonna look good in that's what i mean and, and <laughs> but that's not fun i mean i just mean the combat itself is 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 everything you see is in camera yes but uh, when it's digital flying you know it's digital flying because it looks fucking because it looks stupid you know it look, and like Attack of the Clones, ridiculous, mm-hmm. you know. Now, um, for the combat stuff itself, all the in-camera stuff. Like, see, I'm of two minds because there's part of me that hmm. says, hey, a lot of this is really good. I mean, they're doing it. They're actually doing it. And they're doing it on that day. But then yeah. when I juxtapose it against the Bourne movies, I think, you know, Paul Greengrass, he took over that series and he's doing something that's so much better than this. Um, I think this is I think this is more derivative because you can't help thinking of of the Matrix and mm-hmm. you know they style themselves so much after that with the bursts of slow motion yeah and right the, and the time stoppage that's true and even you know just the look of leather trench coats and sure and shades you know and that well that's and what I meant though it was, feels like to me yeah they were the but Matrix and Bourne were the trendsetters, yeah. you know, because the Daniel Craig Bond films are basically Bourne films in disguise, or at least up. Because you have the point. Matrix in '99, and obviously this movie's drawing on that, but the sequels haven't oh. come out yet. Because they come <laughs> yeah. out in 2003. Oh no! But it's. I mean, it's. Uh, I couldn't, but couldn't quite believe how. I mean, it feels. It feels taken wholesale. It yeah. yeah. Uh, but to me, it's it's still not even done as well as The Matrix was done a few years prior. There are one or two sequences. I, I'd not I like throughout the movie. There's some some of the action I'm nonplussed by, and then there's one or two sequences later on in the movie that just blow. Yeah, me away. right. And I have a feeling when it's, it's good, it's I, really good. Yeah, but no, it's not consistently stand out all the time. Mm-hmm. I, I kind of I like the. But that's what I mean about. But it looks accomplished. Like yeah. It, it look this and this is what I mean about the comparison with Blade Trinity. When you see fight sequences in Blade Trinity, it's just a bunch of guys <laughs> yes. like coming at each yeah. other, very clearly. And this and I'm like, you, but it's I, like I you, you can see a guy standing six feet away saying, "Wait, wait, wait, wait." He's taking it's, that guy yeah. out. Go. Yeah. Uh. And I, I like the fact that that was an attraction of the movie, uh, aside from CGI. Mm-hmm. And maybe that is just pure nostalgia because we don't we don't do that mm-hmm. anymore. Right. Except in the most dedicated fight films, we just we just don't we don't like delineate what's what's good because it's practical and right. what's good because someone you know pressed a button on a mouse and <laughs> made a little man fly. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, and then it's but the action is also like the pacing of it is interesting because it's relentless for like the first what like 10 minutes yeah but it's also 10 15 minutes they... it's like I mean it's just like I'm just watching like like you do with a martial arts movie it's like it's like it's constant yeah. this, this feels like it's, it's everywhere, everywhere. Stop, it doesn't it feel does. like it'll ever end and I think the it's movie like, to a certain extent and like that scene in old boys <laughs> it's just like oh, fucking hell well, so... <laughs> So, you know, I think it does itself a disservice sometimes for a movie that's, what, an hour, almost an hour and 50 minutes? Or no, it is. No, it's two hours. It is two hours, yeah. It's like 158. Just a little under two hours, yeah. We we got away with under two hours, which is impressive when David S. Goyer is involved. True. But it's still too long. And so when you when you are, when the first 10 minutes of your movie is just jam-packed with all this karate, and you have like a five minute karate scene that ends with, wait, we're just here to deliver a message. I mean, you could have started with that. 
<laughs> you know, you're absolutely right. That is so true. I had not even considered that. <laughs> No, this is a terrible misunderstanding. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't yeah, a fight right. sequence at that all. That fight sequence you've been watching for six straight minutes is completely unnecessary. <laughs> I, I, you're absolutely. You make a very compelling point, and I don't disagree. Uh, to to me, what what makes when this movie drags, it's more about the the inability to hand to handle suspense. Mm -hmm. Like I felt bored during the yeah. suspenseful moments of the movie because it's not and really think, that, that movie. That is like. Well, that is like, you know, Del Toro kind of wants to be Hitchcock. He, right, he wants to do something else. Enough to be Hitchcock. But he'll, he can do that later on a different movie. I don't, don't know why I said that like Gollum, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. Oh, that's great. Oh, man. Uh, well, so, you know, it's right around this time. So we, we kind of learn... Well, the other thing that I noticed about that particular fight, though, was you really see Del Toro's kind of monster ideas. Because the, the costumes mm. that these two attacking vampires are wearing are straight out of Hellboy with that sort of mechanical yeah. uh, killer. They look exactly yes. like that. So, yeah, so you I can mean, see the beginning of his stylistic flourishes yeah. as early as this movie. And, and, you know, the element of camp which accompanies his movies. Mm -hmm. The biker with the feather, the feather boa. Sure. Uh, who's kind of the, who's kind of a runner, running gag for the movie. Um, bizarrely. <laughs> uh, and, well, you know, when, when um, Blade, uh, you know, parks the bike beside a Ducati and he gives it a little air kiss <laughs> just these little, little sort of touches, touches of... little flourishes right and and again like it you know at the time i'm like oh yeah okay fine you know a little bit of camp no you know it cuts through the dystopia nicely whatever but i'm not thinking too much of it then i see how comedy works in the next movie and i think it's oh this chef's is where kiss. you need to pitch yeah it. <laughs> yeah you... <laughs> It's chef's the, kiss compared the to that. The air kiss became a chef's kiss. That just movie. Like, oh yeah, that's all the comedy you need. You don't need anything else than yeah. that. Uh because it just comes in it just these little tiny moments um that just you know, ele you just it's just kitsch for a moment and then it goes back to being a serious movie. Um and and you know, there's hundreds of those in the next movie and it becomes t so tight oh. so quickly. I mean um, in the first 10 seconds. <laughs> right. And, you know, even just, like, sort of quirky ideas, like the blood coke. I don't know if that's in the first movie, but I, I did like the... It reminded me of Klingon blood wine. You know, you just take <laughs> you take a basic idea and you add blood to it right. to make it fantasy-like. Yeah. And that's, you know, they're snorting dried... I assume that's what that, it is. I, that's what I assume, blood, too. Right? But, but I didn't um, see... I don't think... I don't remember seeing that in the first movie. Okay. Well, the, the first, first movie many... I had a uh, the first movie starts off with a uh, like a blood rave. So all these people are dancing around. All of a sudden, the the extinguishers just you know let out blood. Interesting. Yeah. Well, this is well, this is one of the first of many uh, references to the drug subtext that ceases to be a subtext after you've mentioned it about seven yeah, or eight times. Right. <laughs> And I like this one because it's visual and it's kind of a gag. Yeah. But, you know, they keep, it, you, they can't stop, speaking of Star Trek, they can't stop making the analogy. You know, it's like, like a heroin mm -hmm. addict or he's just like a guy on crack. It's like, guys, I, like, who doesn't understand that this is a metaphor for drugs at this point? <laughs> you can right? stop mentioning it. You can stop mentioning <laughs> drugs now. Yeah, I, I keep calling them, actually, the, I called them both the chin vampires, and then at some point, the viral vampires, I wrote down a few times. The viral vampires, yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, in 2002, that would probably refer to an actual virus. Now you just think they were popular on TikTok. <laughs> All right. Well, this is a good start. Why don't we uh, take a break? and then? <laughs> it's like... It's like... If you're anything like me, you spend the majority of the day wondering whether you want coffee, beer, or wine. Whichever way you fall, Brew Bar has you covered. 
Located in the heart of 3rd Avenue Village in glorious downtown Chula Vista, California, which is also my neck of the woods, Brew Bar is a coffee shop, bar, and eatery rolled into one delightful package. Tim and Alex run the place, and let me tell you, listeners, these guys know their coffee. And after you've been in their company, so will you. They turn me on to pour over, and it's literally all I drink now. If for some crazy reason you don't want to try the best coffee in the world, they've got espresso drinks, all kinds of teas, and even coffee cocktails. You heard me. Coffee tails. And we're just getting started. Bottle service on craft beer and wine, alcoholic and caffeinated potions, an all-day food menu with plenty of vegan options. All served up in an atmosphere hip enough to know you're getting the best quality, but not too hip that you feel the need to drive to 7-Eleven and get a bucket of brown swill. Brew Bar. It's the best place to be for beer, wine, coffee and tea. And if you go, you might even see me. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. Tom and I are here talking the Blade series. Today it's Blade 2, directed an early movie directed by Guillermo del Toro. All right, let's talk Whistler, Tom. As a, I have, I have questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> I had questions for you, but since you already have questions... No, all right, okay. What are your questions My questions were about your questions, <laughs> so... Okay. Well, I better so ask my questions. by all means, ask your questions. Or there'll be no questions. <laughs> so, please, dear God, tell me he's in the first movie. He is. Okay, okay. And what was it made clear that he had died yes. in the first movie? So no one is expecting him to come back from the dead. Correct. So this is something of a retcon. Yeah. I mean, listen... If I was in the same position and it was a choice between not having Chris Christopherson... Yeah, and exactly. Chris I would want Chris Christopherson. I would bend over backwards yeah. to make that work. But I remember, like, upon watching this film, I remember, you know, because, I mean, it's in the second cold open that you're going to see Chris Christopherson. So I remember yeah. thinking, wait, what? Like, I guess I remember he's in this movie, but I also remember him dying. So what the fuck? Now, my question I mean, it, it for also, you is, does yeah. this movie seem to make it clear what happened? Yeah, I think I think so. Um, I, I made the I made the note that it was a probably a retcon that they probably killed him off. And that the, the you know, the movie is bending over backwards to I mean, to bring him breaking back a life. back backwards. <laughs> um, and I, I just, you know, commented that, like, basically that changes the first yeah. movie. Having still not seen it. Um, because that means the ending is a cliffhanger where it was once uh, a death. Mm -hmm. like, it was like, there was a moment of closure and they yeah. turned it into a cliffhanger retrospectively. So all these... Which I think is kind of cool. Do, do you know anything but... about the first movie? Do you know who the villain was or anything like that? Uh, Duran Duran. I don't know. <laughs> it was Steven Dorff. Oh, that's right. I thought he was going to be in this. Yeah. But it was Luke Goss from Bross, and I was very surprised. <laughs> so, what I remember is Stephen Dorff, and it's violent, like stomping on him. Mm. To the point where, you know, like American History X kind of style, you know? Oh, so okay, he's not... Yeah. Oh, I, he's I not, know. You did just say, yeah, say he's no not more. doing vampire shit. He's, he's, he's beating him to a pulp with, with his boot. Is that why... Chris Christopherson says, I feel like hammered shit. No, I think he feels like hammered shit because I think the retcon is that the vampires also attacked him. Back when Stephen Dorff... So the vampires to... also bit him and turned him into a vampire yeah. so that when he shoots right. himself in the head, it, it's like George Costanza in the shower. It doesn't take. <laughs> <laughs> So he's a, so what? So we have vampires, double vampires, and he's a, a half vampires. Yeah. Vampires, double vampires. And we have a Chris Christopherson a single vampire. Suicide who vampire. Who saves himself. Well, no, it doesn't save himself. Blade saves him with the vampire altering technology shot that I think they had in the first yeah. movie at some point. So we didn't even know in the first movie that he'd been bitten by vampires. Correct. 
Oh, that's a that's pretty yeah. major. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is taking a f- more than a few liberties. Absolutely, right here, isn't it? This is, uh, this is um, this is uh, making Michael Myers and Laurie Strode's sister and brother right. kind of level retcon, isn't it? But apparently, uh, the bite wasn't enough to fix his his limp leg. So. <laughs> But they don't they don't they mention they that do, though? Yeah. They, 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 he's, he's, yeah, they So he still he still has to wear his his uh Batman I guess his knee brace doesn't work quite as well as Goyer's uh Batman knee brace. <laughs> <laughs> as it, it makes him it, it it removes any injury yeah. from his legs. <laughs> makes it bionic be and able to kick stone. Anyway. Not that there should be rubble. any after seven years. Into anyway. rubble, I might add. Uh yeah, I mean the the other big confusion I had was that they were intro- they introduced Norman Reedus's scud as if he'd been in. The now, that was my next question for you. Is sort of the uh, until he started giving up his backstory unprompted, yeah. I was like, uh, probably, probably means not. We haven't seen him before because <laughs> we'd know this, wouldn't we? We'd know we'd know this if he was in the first exactly. movie and. And that's all part of the con, isn't it? That's all part of the sense. It's like you make him seem like an old friend, and he's less suspicious. Mm-hmm. Um, but did you read into that? Uh, after, well, <laughs> the problem was, and you know, this is go, this is skipping ahead yeah. a little bit. But since we're talking about Scud and him being the traitor, spoiler um, alert, everyone! By that, <laughs> by, this right, is a two thousand two film, film, by the way. <laughs> Catch so, um, no angry letters, please. <laughs> uh, like, by that point, there was no one else the trailer yeah, could right. be. Like, there was, like, literally no one left for it to be. So, but in retrospect, I was like, oh, well, it creeps up on you because you think he's uh, close to Blade because they act like he's known Blade for years. For years. And possibly been in the first movie if for some reason you haven't seen the first movie like I hadn't. <laughs> um, so, but I mean, I, I like you thought it was, thought Whistler was still under the influence of the vampires. Mm. Did you think that for the majority of the oh, movie? Oh, no. Uh, oh, no, okay. Well, but when you first saw it, did you think that? Like, I assumed he was the inside man because... He seems like someone they could still have influence over until Luke Goss whispered something in his ear. I was like, well, it's got to be yeah. Scud then because no one else <laughs> right. is left. Yeah, I don't remember ever thinking uh, that about Chris Christopherson. They like the twists. Yeah, it's, you know. They like that. They like these little narrative Well, and the other thing about this movie so is, you know, there are there are plenty of times in this movie where you're asking yourself, I mean, I, I, we're pretty much there, right? I mean, so we, b- b- before we get to the rave, we have the meet the vampires scene. And we're about... The blood the, the Yeah, blood the pack. blood pack. And we're about 25 to 30 minutes in, so we're going to finally learn what the fucking narrative is. Uh-huh. And we understand that these vampires want to destroy the other vampires, and the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and so we're going to work together. Regular vampires and Blade are going to work together to fuck up the double chin vampires. Okay, this is layer three. Okay. So, <laughs> layer three of my four layer yeah. movie. Four layer bean dip. Yeah, that's right. So we got we got contemporary cinema. We got 1980s pop culture. Now we have classic mm-hmm. Hollywood. Because this screams... Well, it's both, actually. It's both second and third layer. It's the Marines and Aliens, as sure. already said. It's also the Dirty Dozen. Oh, because they're being sent out there. Yeah. To, I mean, <laughs> it's the dirty dozen in Aliens too. But you know, <laughs> it's um. So we're starting to see a little bit of kind of Del Toro. Oh, we've already seen it when, uh, um, in the rescue of Whistler, where Wesley Snipes picks up Whistler, looks at him, and says, "Let's go yeah. home," like the ending of the Searchers, yeah. with John Wayne and Natalie Wood, <laughs> and. I actually, even though that's just that's that's just like one of those moments where you think, yeah, but what are you adding to the, you know, it's obvious an obvious restaurant. What are you adding to it? I guess you could argue, uh, an, like I was going to say, an African American man, man holding, a, 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 holding a, a very old white man. 
<laughs> Jiriachi Waiban. <laughs> like, that's the twist, and I really liked it. But so there's a little bit of that classic Hollywood creeping into the to the frame. And you have that there. at the and, end, too, you know, the sort of, you didn't give up on me, I'm not going to give up on you, those kind of lines. Yeah. Um, and, and then something which... I'm trying to trace the the lineage of and 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 I think Kill Bill is a part of this too, the slow motion gang walking yeah, to cool right. music. <laughs> like, does this go back further than Reservoir Dogs? Who was the first to do this? Oh, that's a good question. Like this, because this is in between Reservoir Dogs and Kill Bill. Yeah. And those are the two movies I think of as cementing that. I mean, it. But it's. I mean, it's it doesn't in even have to be. You know, it's in everything. It doesn't even have to be an action movie anymore. I saw it in that. Um, in like an uh, what, what's the name an eighty Bryant sitcom I saw it like just girls going out in the town I'm like wow this this convention yeah. has really started it's really like everywhere now it's a it's it's, it's up virus. there with the slow motion explosion behind you with the slow walk exactly but exactly but I was like oh what what, what was the status of this in two thousand and two would people think it was cool or would they think oh they still think it's old? cool because I mean even ninety eight is Armageddon and you have them walking slow walk into the fucking shuttle yes but that's armageddon nobody thinks that cool. <laughs> <laughs> i'm talking about the people watching the movie not the people obviously the people making the movie think oh cool. you're my mistake my mistake <laughs> um, and i have some more quests can i uh, this is the question yes segment, please clearly uh <laughs> so what's What's the problem? <laughs> this is gonna sound like such a big, such a naive question, but 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 where are right, we? Okay, fine. because I really don't understand, and I think I won't until I see the first movie, and I'm not gonna watch the Ever? first movie until we do these episodes. <laughs> no, I will, but not until we've done All these right. episodes. What's the problem with vampires again? Well, what do you mean? What? <laughs> In general, or you mean Blade? Are they are basically are they a misunderstood subculture, or do they really pose a threat? No, they pose a threat. What's the threat that they pose? That they're gonna kill all of humanity. But aren't the isn't there enough humans who are handing themselves over to the vampires? Yeah, I don't know to make it kind of okay. You know the that basically the first movie kind of traded on this. You know there's sort of a council. With the old vampires and Stephen Dorff is the whatever the hipster biker vampire, who thinks all humans are just meat and wants to eat all of them, mm -hmm. and he doesn't like the old ways and wants to I don't know. Well, but we see that in this club, but the humans seem to be loving it. Well, I think there's like a woman. There's like a woman there is like, yeah, just come, come fucking eat me, and that's and so like the way that oh, I don't and, remember I don't that. I thought the whole like... club was all vampires. Well, there's one scene where they're like just eating a, a woman and she's just like, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that this. they're... Everyone looks yeah. like they're into it. And that's what really confused yeah. me. And I don't know if that's Del Toro going, let's look at this differently. Or whether it's just me going like... No, I think I think he I was doing... I'm, I haven't seen the first Yeah, I film. think that was more of a... He's doing... Well, that's the like other Chamber thing. Chamber of Secrets, Kyle. That, that's the big thing about this movie... In particular, of the three movies, you know, and it's funny because the next movie chooses to make an issue out of it and it almost made it worse. But in this movie, it's like there is nobody in the world but vampires. Almost. That's you know what true. I mean? Yeah. Like, that's what made them seem yeah. just like like part of humanity, part of like just a subculture. Right. You know, you know, they have their clubs. They do their thing. Everyone's consenting. It's OK. That was the vibe mm -hmm. I got. And it was a really weird because this movie is all about how we should kill every vampire we see. And I'm like, why? Yeah. Like, I have a note here. Why do we not like vampires? <laughs> Seems like a lifestyle choice. Yeah, right. Um, so I'm glad I'm glad I'm not entirely. So, yeah, I mean, here, that's the, you know. That's not one of the layers. Though. Okay, that doesn't fine, count as a layer. Fine. That's that's just confusion. So I that's, think in that particular a, scene, that's Principal Skinner's Principal Skinner's <laughs> cancelled due to yeah. confusion. I I would say in the scene you're referencing, that is one particular person that really, whatever, just is up for the sucking. What can I say? 
Okay. Um, and of course, we know about the. <laughs> no, no, you said it all. Say no more. <laughs> and we know about the. She's up. For we know the about the familiars, who. Yes. Well, I didn't, but I figured. Yeah, it out. who just sort of give themselves over because. Yeah. Why not uh, work with them and not get eaten? I guess is the idea, but but these are really the only humans okay. that exist in this world in this movie. It's just like every you know. Well, that's but that's an inversion. I assume that's an inversion, right? It's not this. Yes, because that 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 it's like we we go we're sort of we're starting from the viewpoint of the vampire. Yeah, I mean you you the the first movie. The first movie you were going to see, oh, I forget his name, but um, what's that actor's name that uh, you know was in The Wire? Who gets who gets the grenade in the car in The Wire? Not The Wire, sorry, uh, The Shield. Walton Goggins. No, he Walton Goggins drops the grenade. Oh, Lem. Lem. I don't. Know I don't know the, the actor's actress. name, Lem. <laughs> but he is being led in by. Um, Oh, I'm looking forward to it. If Len yeah, is in. well, not for long, but oh. Uh, oh. he's being brought in by I think Tracy Lords, porn star, mm. okay. and <laughs> I I, I want to know what talent agency I know. <laughs> they were using. They were the fucking casting director <laughs> they were using. They ended up with porn stars and the and people from Bros <laughs> and Stephen Dorff. <laughs> Definitely someone who's not been in, in like a who's not been in a record store or a, or a movie theater right. for twenty years. <laughs> so anyway, you know, yes, the first movie trades on some, you know, like the the female lead is is a human, and she stumbles mm -hmm. into this world, and she's a blood expert, kind of a thing, and. Yeah. But but you know somewhere around at least halfway through that movie I think we dip into, hey we're just following the vampires now, you know. Okay. So, okay. there's some of that in all of these movies. Well, in the next movie they choose moments of not, but it makes it more problematic to me. But yeah, I don't know who they're following yeah. in the next movie. No idea. Still don't have a clue. Um, this is about so. <laughs> I have a note here. Speaking of the Simpsons. Yes. Uh. D Donnie Yen's character in this movie is the the Simpsons archetype of the of the um, guy in the middle of a martial arts sequence who just stands yeah. there. So when so when he does something, you know it's going right. good. That's the role he plays, <laughs> and in slow motion. Uh, and we it did not disappoint <laughs> when he actually. I didn't realize that he went back as far as this. I you know when I saw him in Rogue One, I thought that was his introduction to. Western oh wow! Audiences, okay, but clearly not. Um, and he was responsible for all the fight. Yes, right. And I don't think it's a coincidence that it's him so working good. with Snipes. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I've got a note here about. Oh uh, yeah, so the the double vampires is where they sort of, with the makeup and the prosthetics, they start to make that shift to practical. Yes. That's actually That's good. really, yeah. Like it, it's, it's, it's really impressive. And then later on, when they have the the autopsy scene, mm -hmm. it's all yeah. practical, and it it just and makes, it looks amazing. It makes a huge difference. And it even has it has enough like anus shaped right. organs, you know, in a way that would make David Cronenberg proud. And it has a narrative purpose that scene as well. Yeah, Blade's gonna learn a little something. Yeah, no, I, 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 the like narrative propulsion is pretty, mm -hmm. pretty good, and this it, it, is is pretty, pretty on point in this movie. But um, as I was referencing earlier, so we get to this rave, and we were talking about Whistler earlier, and so there's a lot of this kind of stuff in this in these movies where you think, you know, Scud is getting attacked, and you know Whistler's on the yeah. roof, and you think to yourself, well, where the fuck is Whistler during all of this? Right. Big, well, maybe he's and the maybe traitor. he's the that's traitor. Maybe, but then they then they sense. have a uh, well, I was simply over here kind kind of you yeah. know. And there's a lot of those in this in the in this movie where you and that's a big set piece. This rave scene. I mean, it goes on for a while. 
but most well, of it I, is I, I, this is this is where I got bored. This is where I really just drift. Started so okay, that was my question and for I started you. To th- I started to think about how interesting this would be if it were a Stanley Kubrick movie, and how un- uninteresting it is as a as a Guillermo del Toro yeah, movie. Yeah, and so for me, because most of it is. I think you were referencing, you were talking about Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon earlier. Yeah. Oh, digital and flying. And the digital yeah. flying. And in here, you know, when in, in Crouching Tiger, when you're watching people do it, it's it's purposefully done. And it's there are moments where... Well, they're on wires. They're, mostly, yeah, they're, they're right? on wires and they're gliding, though. Here, you can see that they're on wires and you can see that they're slowly being let down to the floor. But the pace of the fight means it should be happening quicker and it's yeah. not and so it makes it frustrating yeah it is yeah. frustrating i agree i just I, and i also think it's just a problem we've not solved we like we saw it in uh what was the last terminator movie we did dark, yeah, dark fate. fate when they do some digital jumping it's like oh still, yeah, shit. still sucks Check it. Check in with you in like with the cgi years, helicopters you know, and planes like, oh so that yeah, still looks like, like shit I'll, I'll check in with you in another 25 years, see if it's improved. Uh, clearly hasn't improved since Attack of the Clones, so <laughs> keep, keep at it. Um, and also, in I'd, that so, in that fight scene, yeah. there's some there's some poor editing that I don't see in, oh, interesting. in the rest of the movie. I can't remember specifically what it was, but I had a note that said, some of this is, like, strange. I think maybe maybe yeah. part of it was because it was so extended. It's like you're with Ron Perlman and everybody else in the main room, and then you go to Scud, but you go to Scud for so long. It's like seven minutes. Yeah. And then you go back to to Blade, and he's battling with Nomak, but that goes on for ten minutes, and then we come back to the main. You know, it's just, it feels a little disjointed. Well, well, it feels disjointed. I mean, it. I, I don't think it's that much different than you would get in an actual martial arts movie because it's very presentational violence mm-hmm. there's like less less emphasis spent on uh you know that kind of using editing and storytelling yeah, right. they they want to just get the best possible theatrical presentation of a fight yeah. of a fight and the choreography i think that's part of it but you're not wrong that probably they're overextending right. themselves in lots of different areas i want i have another question okay. This is the question segment. So, is this stuff about Nazi, about some of the vampires being, uh, like Aryan uh, master race theorists? Is that in the first movie? Because Ron Perlman and a couple of the other vampires talk about there are there's there's the the Irish vampire. Mm-hmm. You gotta have you an gotta Irish have vampire, an Irish vampire, apparently. yeah. <laughs> Um, to- well, he's not he's Scottish, actually, Tony Curran, but I think he's playing Irish. In but the, I think in he's the Invisible Man uh, in uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. All right. Well, he's he's definitely a Scottish actor, but I think he's playing Is Irish he the one too, who's but... who uh, we have one eye CGI? Yes. Yeah. So, so they talk about pure bloods and they talk about, um, you know, basic sort of master race stuff, like... Some of these, vam- you know, and, and obviously that applies to Blade. Yeah, I mean, you get some race. of that. You get some of that from Steven Dorff, but it doesn't feel as overtly. It's very overt yeah. here. And especially like, and again. No, that, I mean, it is overt in it. that movie. It's, but it's not. Yeah, it is master race shit. It is. With, We're um, us and they're them and there are, you know, there are feedbacks. Like... But to the point where you're looking down racially on a, you know on a southern hick mm-hmm. it made me go like oh these, i mean these are like nazier than yeah. than the nazis from the american south you know they're like they're like <laughs> purer nazis if you yeah i guess the, the difference and, in and the it, first one is that argument and they all have german names uh-huh. and it's interesting because that's what the strains all about yeah right that's interesting formally in the first officers. one it's always more arguments with the council old vampires so it <laughs> It's like like the next generation. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like the council. It's got the council. So like Dutor is like, cut the council. I just want people to hurt each other um, for the movie. And I, I thought this... Uh, and then we have a mission prep sequence, yeah. 
which made me thought this may be 2002, but it has but a soul. Exactly. Of an 80s action <laughs> yeah. Movie. And that's what I mean about these movies seem to pretend that they are the next generation of action movies, but they're not. They, yeah. they, they, yeah, they, they harken, harken back to, to all the, the stuff we've already seen and known. Except that I prefer, like, that's that's from a, a tradition that I prefer. Mm-hmm. And now it looks like, now I'm grateful that they, that they have that kind of sin illiteracy and kind of ability to... To play, to, yeah, right. To yeah. 80s and 90s cinema and, and even further back. And that I, is I the other thing is that it goes further back and so it... Yeah. The searches yeah, you, and... You can see and, choices and being suggest- made by... Del Toro himself, yeah. because he's a fan Definitely. of cinema. Well, he, I think he goes. He's not just a fan of cinema because I'm going to get to my fourth layer now. <laughs> We're three out of four of these All right. layers, and the fourth layer is just classic fiction and mythology. Mm-hmm. Outside of cinema, you've got your right. Tempest, yeah, okay. You've got your. You've got the Bible. <laughs> You've got Frankenstein. You've got Dracula. Um, and he's pulling from all of that. I mean, the the, the building, Yeah, you're right. He's drawing on it. The headquarters of the vampire is called Caliban yeah. Industries. <laughs> and when I saw that, I was like, oh, yeah, there's like an equivalent of Prospero. Right, there's exactly. Miranda. There's a Caliban type character in here. Uh, it becomes a very, again, like Superman Returns, becomes a very Christian movie in the second mm-hmm. half. For some reason, we like to do it in the two thousand early two thousands. We like to make it very Christian for a while. There's lots of Christian allegory stuff, and then you know Luke Goss's story turns out to be Frankenstein's monster. Mm-hmm. Very. But they're also working with a base of va- vampirism. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I I appreciate those those levels. Yeah. In what is such a kind of simple movie, but I totally get what you're saying about that—that that it does have this sheen of being newer than it yeah. is, and that may, and that that is also that's a little that is definitely a, a con, right? But but I'm grateful. I'm speaking that stylistically, not... but but yeah. in your in the subtext thing, you're right. It's it's. But that doesn't. But that doesn't mean you know. It's still it's still a, you know old wine in sure. new bottles coming out of the gate saying we're we're a dynamic this is what i mean about the four layers the you know the top layer is that we're all about what's going on in cinema at the mm-hmm. time but <laughs> the story they're telling is, is like goes is, back to yeah, the oldest yeah. myths of, of of history and prehistory um, all right well let's take another break yeah got got out my questions got yeah my four we got the, we got the questions we got the layers and then we'll come back and we'll finish up all right right after this everybody. Does the coronavirus have you feeling oogie? Have you been sitting on your couch for weeks? Nay, have you been sitting on there for months? Well, it's time for you to get back in shape. Check out 2 a T Fitness. You can find them on Instagram. You can find them on Facebook. 2 a T Fitness was started by Tina Bernard. She is ready and raring to go to help you get back into the shape you want to get into. They've got all kinds of classes. They've got outdoor in-person classes. They've got online classes if that's what you prefer. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to get back in shape. You're going to find a variety of exercises. You're going to have strength training, cardio, weightlifting, even fun five-minute burnouts that will push you to your limits. So get off the couch, get into shape. Go ahead and check out Tua T Fitness. Tina Bernard has got you for all your needs. I know her personally. She's fantastic. You're not going to meet a better person to help you become the new you. Check it out. We are back once again, everyone. Tom and I are here. We're going to finish up with Blade 2, the 2002 film directed by Guillermo del Toro. All right. So, I mean, you referenced it earlier, but after this huge rave scene and we, everything we kind of just talked about, this is when we yeah. get the autopsy scene, mm-hmm. which I think is, like you said, I think it's a a practical effect kind of gangbuster of a scene. I it, yeah. it looks great. Great body, great body. Great body. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> that's my exact note. Effective body horror. There you go. Well, that's sometimes it's you know sometimes it's just self evident. Yeah. 
I also have a note here that says all shit with Ron Perlman is good. Yeah. Because he's Ron Perlman. I, I don't think I have anything left to say about Ron Perlman, sadly. <laughs> I think I took care of that at the top of the show. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, so, you know, the, well, go ahead. You go had on, a thought. On. No, well, I was going to say, like, my notes seem to suggest that, that, that I'm both impressed and disappointed by the screenplay simultaneously oh my god i can't that's my note that's the next thing i was going to talk about oh what's your example well my example is this chat with nissa oh we might have the same exact really carry on well so carry on you know they bring up this idea about you know she drinks blood she knows that at some point he drank blood and that they're far more alike than they are different. And of course, <laughs> this plays out later in how he chooses to save her life. But I wish this relationship was explored more. And I wish right. this avenue, I wish we got more hay out of this avenue. Because it, st- like for a, for a story point, it's very interesting. Yeah. And I think the movie can't see the value that it had through the forest of all the fights and all the other shit. Yeah. That 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 makes sense. Uh, my note wasn't quite that, but it's related. So I I was kind of I was impressed by the gradual cooling and opening up of the emotional dynamics of the film uh-huh. over time with Blade and Nissa and and Scud and even Scud and Whistler. Yeah. The fact that they start to relate to each other just as they find out. He got that great line from Chris Tufts and I was just starting to like yeah. him. <laughs> <laughs> and he re- and what's great about it is not an ironic line. He really he meant means it. it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the same time, like straight after that, we, we have a, a scene that is only in the screenplay to show us what's going to happen later in the movie, but makes no narrative sense. When the vampire is being chased by a double vampire and they go out onto the surface and get burned in the sunlight. Yeah. Why would either of them do yeah, that? Right. <laughs> and it's only to show us what's going to happen later in the movie. Well, I have to say that I'll give the movie this credit. It seemed like the the single vampire, the non-viral vampire, <laughs> had made the choice to sacrifice herself. Okay. I didn't pick up. I just thought like... so. I just thought it was the movie teasing us for a later moment. but I It is. Sure. It's doing that, too. Um, but but yeah, I have I to admit from... that, you know, it does take you by surprise. Your first thought is, what the fuck did you do that for? Right. But there was this idea, to me... Doesn't it uh, create a problem, though? Doesn't it make it worse for the people down below? Yeah. It brings out the other double vampires, I believe. Hmm. I don't know. Well, they also keep, you know, Ron Perlman walks through it. He puts his hand out. Right. You know. And he's like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> that stings. Um, also, you're going to love. What am I going to You're going to love this. Cause the, what am I going to love? Matt Schultz, who plays Chupa. Uh huh. You know, the guy who ends up. Uh, I said, uh-huh, I don't know who she <laughs> is. <laughs> He's the guy who attacks Chris Christopherson. Oh, the the Nazi guy. Yeah, the, the blonde so guy. The, you yeah, know, yeah, he yeah. and Pearlman start fucking... What? Why is he called Chupa? I don't know. The guy's a fucking... He's like blonde hair, blue eyes. But that actor... Should be called that, Gun- Gunter. That actor's in the first movie playing a completely different character. Oh, God. Why do these movies do this <laughs> to know. us? How great is he that? He Chris farley it. He Chris farley Yeah. Um, I, 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 I lied when I said I didn't have any more questions. <laughs> okay. Fine. I feel like this is what I feel like I know the answer to. Do UV lights appear as a plot point in the first movie? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, if I recall, it was... Um... Because we talk about UV light a lot. a lot. And not just in this movie, the next movie. Yeah. And I'm just like, like, are you try is it are you trying to rebrand sunlight? <laughs> like what what are you trying to do here? Is this like the big UV came yeah, and said I... every, instead of saying sunlight, always say UV mm-hmm. light, okay? 
the, if I remember, it was like new technology. Like there was a big chunky light, like, you know, like a spotlight kind of thing. And they burn a yeah. big fat vampire with it. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta really roast that. <laughs> Get that vampire flesh nice and crispy. With UV's the only thing that does it. But uh, but I thought that like is isn't this just part of this twenty first century early twenty first century UV light obsession in cinema, writ large. You know everything we talked about with the Batman movies. Right, yeah. It's kind of day glow shit. Is it? Is that? Is that what this is? I don't. I don't know. But if it's in this the first feels movie, different, I'll give, but I'll give it. I'll give it a pass. Yeah. If we have the, you know, the 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 fat vampire on the spit. There you go. Roasting. That's fine. <laughs> um. So we have, and we we do something that we see in lots of sequels where we invert the inversion. <laughs> <laughs> so turns out the vampires were the bad guys all along. Right. And the double vampires are it was just a kind double of misunderstood. Cross. Yeah, they're just sort of, and then the and then the double vampires become the allies that the vampires once were, kind of temporarily. Yeah. But we, I mean, you know, it, this is this is, I mean, yes, it's another kind of narrative twist, but you, you see it coming a mile off. Sure. Because Blade is Blade is like, uh, yeah, that, as soon as as soon as we're as done, soon as we're done, they're gonna they're fuck gonna us. fucking kill us. <laughs> yeah. So I do like that they have that in. So, uh, I mean. It's easier to believe that because of how they feel about each other than the moment that yeah. Blade reveals. But this is where it really does scuttle. become Frankenstein because the monster you yeah. created is the monster you can't control. Yeah. Um, and it, except and it's scuttles. literally your son, not the son you created. Yeah. Right, which is the Christian part. Yeah. And the other Christian part is is uh, kind of crucifying Blade. Yeah. Um, so, and we get for a while, and again, like it's all, well, I don't know why Christian allegory stuff is all concentrated. In <laughs> gadget movies. stakes though. Gadget stakes. Yeah, gadget stakes. For the, for the next like five, 10 minutes of the movie, it's just like Gothic horror versions of Christian rituals. Mm-hmm. Cause then we get him re reborn in a bath of blood. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like the reverse baptized, baptism. Yeah. <laughs> the reverse baptism. And so it's like, you're just like, why is this all concentrated in the same part of the movie instead of like spread? Well, and it's, I mean, it's, you you know, to to bring another series in, it's coming fast and furious, isn't it? Yeah, just like one after um, another, just don't 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 don't. don't. <laughs> <laughs> but but this is, I think this is where like the best fight stuff of the movie yeah. happens as well. These are like the show stuff, except for Ron sequences. Perlman. That's kind of anticlimactic. Yeah. Yeah, true. Um, maybe it is like a like a Danny but a Trejo, pretty good like, effect. I mean, it was kind of fun just to see his body split in half. Yeah, I wonder. I mean, you know, like if you didn't know how else Guillermo del Toro used him, you would say he was underused. Mm-hmm. But if you know that Hellboy is, you know, he's going to do Hellboy with him, then you're like, okay, fair enough. It's yeah. like Danny Trejo with Robert Rodriguez. I, you will be some, just, yeah. just do this one thing in the movie, and then and I, I got you. I'll build a whole franchise around you. <laughs> um, and that's exactly the same here. Yeah. So it's just like Ron Perlman is just an added bonus. And pleasure. Scud blowing up is a pretty fun effect as well. Yeah, that's good stuff. Absolutely. Um, And yeah, I did. I mean, we we the shades are obviously the Matrix, but is it also a little bit of the Terminator? I noticed that the score got kind of synthy when he put when he put the shades back on. I I don't get Terminator I thought, vibes. I thought Bad to the Bone was about to come. I in. don't get Terminator vibes, and okay. I always assumed... I could have sworn I heard. I, I could have sworn it went a bit Brad Fiedel <laughs> and. When he put those shades on. Maybe that's just me. But Maybe I I'm, think I'm of The Matrix, it. too. But I also kind of always assumed that this was part of the comic book. So it was his, it, it was, I kind of took it as its own thing anyway. Also, maybe they were saying Terminator took it from us. Yeah, of. maybe. And speaking of which, did Blade invent the Black Widow landing? <laughs> I know, right? I mean, they're both Marvel properties. Because I, I, he's got a... And you, are you telling me Joss Whedon's not a fan of Blade? Right. Like, I don't believe I, you if you there's say a, no. There's a 
like a big ass Black Widow landing in the first movie on the stone. Oh, okay. All right. Like, yeah. Um, I think, but that I, glasses because... throw from Whistler is hilarious. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, the way, the, just, I mean, in the last Black Widow movie, well, Black Widow, um, <laughs> they, <laughs> they make such a big thing about that landing. Yeah. That's why it was on my mind. But that's you're introduced uh, to her like that in Iron Man too, right? So maybe they're going to retcon it that she took it from Blade. <laughs> maybe. Except it won't be Wesley Snipes' Blade, mm-hmm. so it won't make any sense. By the way, I'm horrified that they're at, that they they're recasting Wesley Snipes. I'm really outraged. <laughs> um, I think you made that he's clear still alive. already. He's still alive. He looks pretty much like he did there. <laughs> Twenty years. 20 years and some of that time in jail apparently has not aged him. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, all I all I have from this point onwards, I have the, the reverse searches moment. We have an inversion of their, mm-hmm. of their... We have a second searches reference, and it's an inversion of the first one <laughs> with the half-breed. And it's also a searches inversion because it's the half-breed carrying the pure blood out to die. Right. Uh, not that, not that um, Natalie Wood is mixed race, but in the course of that movie, she kind of is. At least in John, <laughs> at least in John Wayne's racist eyes, she's mixed race. Mm-hmm. Um, and Whistler's standing there, going, "Hey, that's what he did to me earlier in the right, movie." Right, exactly. <laughs> but it also um, harkens back to my point before to me, you know, because it's it's supposed to be the the you know the the sad moment in which. You almost it almost feels like they're lovers, but they never got there. Right, it's really involved. They 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 really get involved with her and her father. Yeah. But it's that I mean that's a that kind of. But again, to your side, point, all of that is coming that at such story. a rapid pace. Yeah. The son comes back. The daughter betrays the father. The father dies. Yeah. Was but it's, was the brother I mean, gonna eat the good daughter? Stuff. Sorry. Was the brother gonna eat the daughter? Or the sister, rather, and then Blade comes in, or uh, I can't remember that. I don't that... remember. Probably, I think that I think that's pretty much it. Um, but I kind of like that. But I agree with you. It's like it's it's less. I think one of one of maybe the disadvantages of of, of bringing in a director like Del Toro is he's got his own agenda. Because mm-hmm. if you watch The Strain, it's kind of all that stuff that goes on at Caliban Industries. That's the really? that's all of it. So I do wonder whether he's just like, no, nah, I'm more interested in this yeah, right. than than my main character yeah. kind of thing going on, which we've seen in sequels too. Sure. Um and next note I have is about the the movie's weird button. Like the weird the final the... scene of the movie. Yeah. So we're suddenly in London. Right. And I'm going, uh, is this the same film? Did I accidentally switch my Netflix over to Last Night in Soho? What's what's going on? Did it did it, uh, did it uh, not did it not go through all the credits and it just immediately went to another movie? Yeah, exactly. I was just like I was like, oh, okay, we're okay, we're we we're resetting, you know, like we're geographically relocating. <laughs> I I'm pretty sure the movie's nearly over. This see this is weird. Um and you know it's it's to sort of follow up on something that is only a runner because you've decided to make the end of the movie about yeah right you know what I mean which is like so we've seen so basically I mean sadly because we also we didn't talk movie. about this guy for the entire he gets away yeah he gets away at the beginning yeah. of the movie and then um, when Wesley Snipes is standing in the in the vampire club looking like a bouncer um, he says catch you later. Right, right. So you know, it's like I guess when you look back, you go, "Oh, beginning, middle, and end." It's like it's a, it's like a, you know, it's like a way of tracking yeah. a movie. But I don't know. You've got to really care about loose ends to find this effective, right? Is there anyone in the theater going like punching the air? Like, <laughs> yes, Yo, got him. So glad he got yeah, that guy. Exactly. All those other people he killed meant nothing. Well, it just feels like one of those things that. You know what's sad, actually, is it feels like something... It Well, it makes sense, though. 
because <laughs> I was going to say, it feels like something you'd see in a David S. Goyer movie. Oh, interesting. But this is a yeah. fucking David S. Goyer written movie. David. So, of course it's there. I mean, I... And again, this is in retrospect, I came to appreciate this ending. Uh-huh. Because the ending of the next movie is just so horrible. Right. And so... I, I mean, I'm I'm sort I'm kind of into it, but I also sort of think I just it's the switch to London that just sort of got you fucks with me. <laughs> like I was like, that's a big that's a big relocation, and I think he's even using like stock footage from like 1970s documentaries about pawn clubs or something. <laughs> like it, it's like. It's like it's really 1960s London yeah. suddenly. I'm like, uh, what, what's going on? <laughs> like I said, it's like Last Night in Soho. It's exactly the same iconography. Yeah, it is. We haven't, you know, we haven't, we've never been here. We'll never go back. No. We'll never return to this. Um, but, yeah, I just it felt like someone who just can't leave a loose end hanging. <laughs> That was it. That that was what it was. I mean, and that's yeah. That really is all it is. I mean, it's yeah. it's it's the movie's runner. So, but it's not the runner until they do this. Yes, that's true. You know what I mean? Like they made it a runner. Like it's an artificial runner. It's not. But if it wasn't motion. there, wouldn't you be saying? I mean, we saw no. that fucking guy twice. No. no. Well, your rule of three, I guess. Maybe right. some people would, but. You know, he says, you thought I forgot about you, didn't you? I thought, well, I, I had. had. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but that's what makes Blade the best. <laughs> so I'm on to my credit check if you don't have any, do anything else. You I, you know, yeah, I pretty much have everything. I mean, this is, uh, you know, all in all, like you said, you know, a add your choice of candy to your popcorn. You're going to have a good time. No, specifically Reese's Pieces. That's the only candy that will work with this movie. <laughs> I know people I who like I... the milk duds with popcorn. I'm on your side. Reese's too Pieces. Too chewy. Too chewy. You don't need. You don't want that kind of extra jaw work. <laughs> popcorn Reese's Pieces. <laughs> M and M's too. Some mouth. people go M and M's. M and M's. I can see. Re milk duds. Nah. I know of one. I, I, I can remember. I'm pretty sure I know one. I've person. always wanted to do that Simpsons thing where you put the butter in the milk. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> that sounds truly um, terrible. Uh, credit check me. Okay. I feel I feel like we've covered a lot of this. Um, David S. Gore here. Well. In, in in retrospect, we're lucky we got out here in, in under two hours with restrained emotion from most people. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's the Del Toro effect. I don't think of him as a melodrama guy. <laughs> um, no crying in <laughs> Del Toro movies. <laughs> um, and then when I saw it was only when I saw Stan Lee's name that I realized this was a Marvel movie, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> because there's no other evidence. Like when you think about what that's coming, well, to it, mean and in it the doesn't present itself with out. all the no. other Marvel movie rules. You don't see Stan Winston in these movies, that kind of thing. Stanley, Stan what did I say? Stan Winston. Jesus Christ, <laughs> that would be fucking awesome if we saw. Sorry, Stanley. This guy, you, can you just imagine like someone just tears their face off and it's Stan Winston inside, <laughs> like the Terminator? That's fucking awesome. <laughs> you kidding me? That's, that's the great. cameo we were denied. Oh. Yeah, yeah, you're right. There's, it's 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 almost like, even without, <laughs> even without knowing it, Del Toro was kind of detoxifying. Yeah, right. This the Marvel out of this movie. Um, we talked about fight choreography, actors, the actors doing their own. Mm -hmm. How good it is. Uh, this may be the last time that like a a, a score that uses contemporary pop music. Is still tolerable to my ears. <laughs> <laughs> We've got like Dan the Automator, Paul Oakenfold, Groove Armada, some of the best dance and hip hop artists of the time are attached to this movie. And my favorite track of the favorite mu piece of music in the whole movie is the Gangster Queens, which is like the second half of the credits by Groove Armada. It is amazing. All right. I don't know why they put it at the bottom of the credits, but I'm glad they did because. 
you know, I got I got to do I, I got to do something from with look, it. Looking for funny names. Um, <laughs> uh, con- there are some contact lens specialists. That's that's for with this that's movie. for Snipes himself. Yeah, um, it's not what I think of when I think of optical effects, but there it is. <laughs> How dare you! Uh, that was pretty bad. <laughs> no real Reapers were hurt in the making of this film. I saw that myself. Yeah, yeah a nice little Naked Gun-esque uh, mm-hmm. addition to the closing credits. And that's that's uh, that's my credit check. All right. Well, we did it. We certainly did. You know, it's funny, like, looking back on us talking about it, it's, you know, because it's just one of those movies. It's... Uh... We're not we're not gushing and glowing over it, but yeah, you know, we're not shitting all over it either, and so that kind of lends to itself to. I don't know. It's interesting because I think this movie is thought of as the best in the series, and the people who love it really love it. But yeah. to me, it's a, you know, it's it it's a, it's one of those movies that steps on both sides of the line of good bad. There's a lot to like in this movie, but but it's 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 not a great movie. It's a good movie. No, it's, it yeah, it, it's it's yeah. It, it, <laughs> I'm sure it did win some awards, but it's not you know it's a kind of movie you say it's not going to win any no, awards. No, yeah, that's the thing. This whole, whole series, considering you know maybe makeup or whatever, th- there are no Academy Award nominations for these movies. If it's nominated, I feel like there would be now. If it's nominated, it would be for things like Saturn Awards, yeah, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's it's. I mean, you know, there's there's value, but there's value in this. I think yeah. there's value in in a in a perfectly perfectly acceptable movie. Espe- but you know, especially it's less disappointing when it's a piece of pure entertainment like yeah. this. You're less you you want to poke fewer holes in it um, than you do with a movie that is you know considered great but is actually mediocre. Yeah, exactly. Like for, for, off the top of my head, the English Patient. That's, you know, I, don't, <laughs> I could name many more. Finally, you and I can agree on something. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone still talk about that movie? I'm Elaine Benes. Except for when that uh, uh, I know I was going to say the only time anyone talks about that movie is when it was on. Seinfeld yeah. in syndication. That when that episode was on Seinfeld in syndication, and someone the next day goes, "Hey, you remember? Do you remember the English Patient? I just saw that Seinfeld last yeah. night." No one's talking about the fucking movie ever. I mean, it's it's Avatar level, right? Cult, cult Except we don't have vacuum. four more coming. We don't have four more uh, English patients. So sure. The English patients. <laughs> <laughs> the Eng- the English patient's hitman's bodyguard. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it. What do you think of Blade 2, everyone? You're going to have to let us know. Find us on Facebook. Find us on Instagram. Go ahead and go to Twitter. Let us know. Or send us an email to everythingsequel at gmail.com. We want to know what you think of uh, this early Guillermo del Toro movie. And if you uh, let us know, we'll read it out on air. All right. That's it. For Tom Stewart of Lonesome Whistle Productions, Michael Schantz here of the How Dare You Awards. Coming up next time, Blade Trinity. Say goodbye, Tom. Better get you some sunscreen, buttercup. (laughs) Bear in mind, it's a white man saying that. Right. To another white man. (laughs) No more or less pale than him. (laughs) That's great. All right. We'll be back.